Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about how to create mood in your writing. Now before we get into today's lesson, the first thing you need to do is you do need to access the lesson handout on Buzz. So uh, I'll go ahead and show you where to find that and then you can get your assignment opened, make a copy of it, and then follow along. All right, so once you get to the Buzz agenda, let's go ahead and scroll down to Squad C Virtual. Now, there is going to be a video here. It's obviously not there yet because I'm making it right now, but you will see that when you go to your agenda. And then go ahead and click on where it says Creating Mood in Your Writing, Presentation plus Handout. It's going to take you to a page that looks like this. Now, the presentation is what we're going over in this video, so you don't necessarily need to open that up, but definitely go ahead and click where it says Handout and then make a copy of this document so you can pause the video and type as we go through the assignment. All right, so here we go. How to create mood in your writing. We already have a copy of the handout, so you don't have to worry about that. The techniques we're gonna focus on today are going to be using word choice, using figurative language, and using imagery to create a desired mood. Now, Using word choice to create a desired mood is the first one we're going to tackle today. And here's what I want us to do. I want us to practice this. So I want you to rewrite this sentence by replacing the underlined words with verbs and adjectives that go along with the desired mood. So we want to create a frantic mood. So go ahead and pause this video. On your document, you're going to see this exercise. So let's go ahead and take a look here. It says rewrite the sentence below by replacing the underlined words with verbs adjectives that go along with the desired mood. Go ahead and pause and complete this activity and then come back to the video. If I'm going for a frantic mood, what I might say is instead of Jared turned off his beeping alarm clock and got out of bed, um, all of these words that are underlined aren't very descript. I might say Jared slammed off his screeching alarm clock and scrambled out of bed. So that creates a more frantic mood than the previous sentence that's listed here. All right, let's go ahead and uh, I want you to, as we go through this, to take a look at the word choice in your original response. So I know some of you have already posted to the discussion board. If that's the case, what I'd like you to do is comment on your own uh, on your own original post and then you're going to put your revised version of this response so what you can just do is copy and paste it add what you need to tweak what you need to and then post the updated version of your check or of your response onto that discussion board all right, so what I want you to do, and you can pause this video or you can just do this all at the end, I want you to look at the word choice in your description of a room in your house or if you're in class, the description of the classroom. So underline all of the adjectives and verbs you use in your description of the classroom or just identify them in whatever way you'd like and then remove any nondescript adjectives and verbs and replace them with words that help you develop the mood. So like we talked about in that last example, instead of saying he got out of bed, we could say he scrambled out of bed to create a more frantic mood. So that's what you're looking to do in your description of a room. So you can go ahead and pause your video or you can save this at the end and on your sheet, I do have a checklist for you to look at your own writing with. Next up, we're going to be talking about how to use figurative language to create a desired mood. And the two different types of figurative language we're looking at today are going to be similes and then personification. So a simile is a comparison between two seemingly unlike things using like or as. So here's an example. She tried to get rid of the kitten which had scrambled up her back and stuck like a bird just out of reach. So that was taken from Little Women. Now, there is a question here that's going to be on your handout. It says, based on the simile above, what mood is the author trying to convey? Take a minute right now and go ahead and uh, take a stab at what you think the mood of that example is. You can pause this video and try it on your own. 
All right, so the mood for this example may be agitated or annoyed because it's describing the kitten as if it were a bird just out of reach. So something that's pesky, annoying, couldn't quite reach it. So we can go ahead and say uh, that's gonna be the mood for this uh, particular example. Now let's go ahead and we'll take a look at another example, but this time it's going to be one of personification. So here's the example. It says, uh, well, first of all, the definition of personification is giving human qualities to something that is not human. And here's an example. In the meeting house windows, blank and bare, gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. And this is from Paul Revere's ride. Now, Based on the personification we see above, what type of mood was Longfellow most likely trying to convey? And also on your document, why don't you go ahead and bold or mark any instances of personification in the example above? Remember, that's giving human qualities to something that's not human. All right, if we're looking at this example, obviously the meeting house windows are what's being uh, personified here. And it's saying they're gazing at him with a spectral glare. It also says as if they already stood aghast, so like the windows themselves are aghast, at the bloody work they would look upon. So it's personifying the windows here, and we have to ask ourselves, all right, well, what type of mood is being set? Well, it's mentioning that the windows are gazing at him with a spectral glare. Spectral means like ghostly or phantom glare. And then we get um, as if, they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. So overall, this person, this example of personification seems to create a very ominous or foreboding mood because it's as if the windows are looking ahead and imagining what they're going to see and imagining themselves standing aghast at the scene. All right, let's go ahead and head back to the presentation. Now what I want you to do in your personal response of either the classroom or a room in your house, I want you to look at your description of particular objects in the room and you can choose one object and use a simile to describe that object or you can personify it by giving it human qualities. So say I'm talking about the clock in the classroom. I can personify the clock or I can use a simile to describe the clock and it's all going to depend on the mood I'm trying to create. All right and then the final strategy we're going to go over today is going to be using imagery to create a desired mood. Now just so we know imagery relies on the senses so it's what you see, what you feel, what you hear, what you smell, and what you taste. So here's an example of imagery. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. So, this question here, and it's going to be on that handout, which senses does Orwell target in the passage and what mood does the imagery create? So take a minute, go ahead and go to your handout. Once you get there, you're going to go ahead and respond to what senses Orwell is targeting in this passage and then what mood he's creating with the imagery. All right, so first of all, he's targeting sight. So it's talking about, uh, it's giving us a visual of what's going on here. So it's a bright, cold day in April. We know that the clocks are striking 13. Now, we're also getting some um, some auditory, so we're getting some uh, sound here as well. We hear the clocks striking 13. Um, it goes on and it talks about how um, the wind is vile and it slipped quickly through the glass doors of the uh, the victim. Victory Mansions, um, and then it talks about the swirling of gritty dust entering with uh, the person in this uh, response, Winston. Um, now, it also gives us some smell when it says the hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. Uh, pretty gross. Now, we want to ask ourselves what mood this imagery is creating. 
Based on some of the imagery we're getting, we might describe this mood as being quite bleak. So even though it's a bright day, it is very cold. It describes the wind as being very vile. It's slipping quickly through the doors. Um, then when Winston walks into the building, the hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. So we're not getting a very happy, uplifting image or picture of what's going on in this scene. Now, the next challenge on your handout says to practice. So I want you to practice this strategy of really uh, targeting the senses uh, by describing eating a piece of candy using three out of the five of your senses. Um, and I want you to have a specific mood for this. So you could choose to either have an excited mood as you eat the candy or a disgusted mood as you eat the candy in your description. Make sure you are typing that description that includes a lot of imagery in on your lesson handout. In your response, I want you to take a look at what you've put down so far, either in your description of the classroom or room in your house. And I want you to include at least two instances where you invoke your reader's senses. So say you want to get a smell across. You really want to describe that smell in a way that throws your reader into um, into the scene and really captures the mood you're trying to get after. Same thing with if I'm visually trying to describe something in the room, I want my reader to be able to mentally picture it in their mind. Now the last thing we're going to do is take a look at the checklist you need to have for your description of the classroom or again if you're a virtual learner, a room in your house. So Work through this checklist. We already talked about all of these pieces separately in this presentation. However, just as a reminder, here's what you need to make sure you're including in your description. So first of all, for word choice, you wanna look at all the adjectives and verbs you use in your description, and then you wanna remove any nondescript adjectives and verbs. So instead of saying, oh, uh, I looked over at the poster, or the poster was looking at me, maybe I'll say the poster was scowling at me, right? So I want to choose words that really go after a specific mood. All right, so that's for word choice. Then I want to take a look at figurative language. And remember, for this one, you're going to include at least one example of personification or one simile. And then the last part of this is imagery. You want to make sure that you include at least two instances where you're invoking your reader's senses. So maybe you're going to describe in detail uh, something that you want people to imagine that they're hearing as they read your piece or seeing or smelling. All right, that's that for today. Uh, again, what we're trying to do here is create a mood for our reader in our writing. Uh, hopefully this does help us better understand how authors will use different strategies to create mood in their writing. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and I will see you soon.